Father, what an honor, what a privilege that we can enter into your presence. And God, we so look forward to the day where we can stand before you, God, completely unashamed, with no veil separating us. God, we hunger and we thirst for you. As the deer, God, panted for the water, so our soul longs for you, Lord Jesus. Please, God, speak to us this morning. Holy Spirit, touch us. God, just drench us in the love that you have for each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, he gives a warning. He said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. False prophets or teachers may look as innocent as sheep, may sound spiritual, they'll use religious language that is 90% truth, and that's what makes them so deceptive. But if their lives do not bear the good fruit of obedience to Jesus' teachings, they are false guides. And John hits on this in 1 John. How can we tell a false prophet? What is their witness or their testimony of Jesus Christ, and what is the fruit of their ministry? Verse 2 in chapter 4 says, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And we talked about this in chapter 1. Um, true prophecy, true teaching will present a true Jesus. In John's day, the issue was if Jesus had truly come, in a real body of flesh and blood. Today, we might hear a person confess that Jesus has come, but deny that he's God. But we're told in verse 1, not to believe every spirit, but to try or test the spirits to see if they are of God, because they, there are many false prophets that are gone out into the world. We are never to assume that every spiritual experience or every spiritual, or excuse me, every demonstration of spiritual powers from God. We have to test spiritual experience to see if they are in fact from God. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, test all things, hold fast or cling to what is good. There was a lot of false doctrines. There are, excuse me, a lot of false doctrines and there are many, many false teachers Beware when someone says, the Bible's too hard to understand. It's best that you read our book instead of the Bible, or you need the Bible and our book in order to be a Christian. I had some really nice boys in white with black ties try to convince me of that recently. Beware when a ministry tries to steer you away from the Word of God or try to convince you that is not relevant for today. Beware when a ministry doesn't use the word of God, and I'm going to add in its entirety to teach you. This is why I love Calvary Chapel, and I've been born in it. I've been brought up in it. But do you know, it is something that we can be so thankful for because we're faithfully taught the word of God verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. 
and we're constantly and consistently encouraged to get into the Word of God ourselves and become students of the Word. Pastor Chuck said it like this, God didn't say anything weird, and if your interpretation of Scripture is weird, then you've got the wrong interpretation. <laughs> God said what he meant, and if you would just read the Bible, the Spirit of God will teach you the truth. Verse 3 talks about the spirit of the Antichrist, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. John's already mentioned this in chapter 2. The spirit of the Antichrist is the spirit which opposes the true Jesus and tries to offer a substitute Jesus. The believer doesn't have to fear being deceived by this because look at the, pro the protection given the child of God in verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Who is in you? Verse 13 says, By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us because he has given us his spirit. I can confidently say that I know that I abide in God and he in me. How do I know? By beginning, by beginning this verse, verse 13, with the words, by this, John connected the thought of this verse directly to verse 12, which says, if we love one another, <clears throat> God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. We can know that we live in God if his love has been perfected in us, and we know that his love has been perfected in us if we love one another. A Christian can say, I know. You don't have to hope that you're saved. You don't have to hope that you'll make it to heaven. You know, I said I was brought up in church, and every time I heard the sinner's prayer, I was saying that prayer. You know what I'm saying? I was saying it over and over and over again, just in case, just in case I'd messed up and I had lost my salvation. But you know what? We can know, and we can know now, because Paul said in Ephesians 1, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Having believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the seal is God's mark of ownership on you. Believer, you belong to God. John 10 says, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. He has got his grip on you. The Bible says that the spirit that dwells in you is greater than he who is in the world. This means the Christian has no place for fear. We have many spiritual enemies, but not one of them is greater than Jesus who lives in us. Believer, you have the source for victory. The very presence of the living God is in you. And that makes victory always possible if you rely on he who is in you. We're going to continue. Verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love. Those who are loved, let us love. The command to love one another isn't so we earn or become worthy of God's love. We're commanded to love because we're loved by God. And it's proof of God's love in me and proof to the world that I belong to him. John 13 says, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. John's already talked about loving one another in chapter 2 and chapter 3. 
And here he shows us why it's so important. If love is of God, then those who claim to be born of God and claim to know God must be able to love one another. If we've been born again, born of God, experienced God, know God, then his love will be evident in and through our lives. This agape, unconditional love is not perfected in us on this side of eternity, and nor is it easy. It may not be perfected, but it must be present, and it should be growing. Who's our example? Jesus. Ephesians 4 says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. What should be my measure of forgiveness? God's forgiveness for me. I've been forgiven so much. Therefore, therefore I should forgive much. Jesus said to forgive as he forgives. Jesus was betrayed, denied, beaten, scourged, mocked, spit upon, <clears throat> had accusations hurled at him, had nails driven through his wrists and feet, nailing his body to a cross. And as he hung there, what were the words that he uttered from his bruised and beaten lips? Father, forgive them. Forgive them for they know not what they do. That is the forgiveness of Christ. Jesus said to love as he loved. How did Jesus love his enemy? For three years, Judas walked with Jesus on the road, ate with him, slept on the same floor. Jesus taught him just as the same as the other disciples. He provided for his needs and allowed him to be a part of every event, every miracle, every struggle, every prayer meeting, every teaching. Was this because Jesus wasn't aware of Judas, who Judas was? No, and when Judas came to betray him, what did Jesus call him? He said, my friend. Jesus loved Judas. That's the love of Christ. We struggle with some of the smallest, most petty, ridiculous things. We hold things against each other and refuse to forgive. Jesus said, forgive as I forgive and love as I love. And love one another as I have loved you. You know, I've, I've told you before, <clears throat> excuse me, when Derek is away, sometimes I don't sleep very good. <laughs> and I had one of these nights um, about a month ago. And so I woke up at 2, and I just started thinking. And I, a relationship that um, I have was brought to my mind, and I was just thinking of just, um, just good experiences and special memories and... I'm just thinking about that person. And then I kind of fast forwarded to today and I was like, where am I with this person? You know, we were so close and now our relationship is so distant. It's so far. <clears throat> and I started to think about a wood wedge, which I know most of us think about wood wedges in the middle of the night. <laughs> Yeah, um, which is, you know, for, for you girls, you, you don't know country girls, but um, they're, it's a, you know, triangular shaped heavy um, tool that's used for splitting wood. And um, small pieces of wood can just be, you know, chopped with an ax, but the larger solid pieces of wood, you need a wedge. And you tap that wedge into the piece of wood with the blunt side of an ax. And it begins to make an indent. And the more you hit it, it you know, it's a crack begins to grow. 
and you keep hitting it, and as it goes farther down, that gap begins to widen and until, until there's that last you know, blow and that solid piece of wood is split. And I felt the Lord show me that that's where I am with a person in my life. I've allowed anger and I've allowed bitterness and I've allowed frustration and maybe even I can uh, justify it. Maybe I think I have cause not to be loving and not to be reaching out to that person. But that wedge has come between us and it has divided us. And that's what it does. That's what lack of forgiveness does. God wants us to love. And God wants us to love everyone. <laughs> this is God's kind of love. It's not the world's love and it's not our own love. So where do we get it? It seems so obvious. It comes into our life through our relationship with God. If we want to love one another more, we need to draw closer to God. Then it's possible to forgive as he forgives and love as he loves. That's what the Holy Spirit will do in us as we are filled and I can know that it is the Spirit of God because of the love that he has given me. Verse 9 says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Romans 5 says, says that God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How do you know God loves you? Is it blessings in your life? Is it health, wealth, and prosperity? No, it's the cross. God demonstrated his love once and for all by sending his son to die for you. And that's sufficient. You don't, you don't ever need to doubt the love of God again. If you are, look at the cross. Spurgeon said, if there was to be reconciliation between God and man, man ought to have sent to God. The offender ought to be the first to apply for forgiveness. The weaker should apply to the greater for help. But this is love that God sent. This is God's love. God reached to you. His it was his arm that extended out to grab a hold of you. God manifested his love in sending his only begotten son into this world. He gave his very best. Love gives its best. There was nothing better that God could give. Second Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, Paul describes Jesus as the Father's indescribable gift. James Boyce said, If God had merely sent Jesus to teach us about himself, that would have been wonderful enough. It would have been far more than we've deserved. But the wonderful thing is that God did not stop with this, but he sent his Son not merely to teach or to be our example, but to die the death of a felon, that he might save us from our sin. God loved you so much that he sent his son into the world to die in your place, to take away your sins in order that you might have fellowship with God. And in verse 9 it says that we might live through him. Jesus took the punishment that our sin deserved. His sacrifice turned away the judgment that we would have received. Verse 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, 
we also ought to love one another. John was so familiar with this example of receiving from God and giving to others because he was able to see the one who was love in action. Just one small example of this is in the book of John. The Bible says that Jesus, before the feast of the Passover, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. He poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the feet of the disciples and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. I, met it, I thought about this portion, and I think Jesus took great care and time on each one of their feet, maybe even praying for each one of them individually as he did this. And I can imagine, you know, there's 12 of them at a dinner table. There was probably some noise. And as Jesus just quietly rose and started this process, I can just hear, you know, you can just imagine that noise subsiding as each disciple turned and began to notice what Jesus was doing. He went person to person, including his betrayer. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples to show them how to love and how to serve. We might have expected him to end by maybe gesturing to his own feet and asking who among them was going to wash his feet. But instead, Jesus said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. The proper way to love God in response to his love for us is to go out and love one another. Spurgeon said, this love will lead to practical action. Has anybody offended you? Seek reconciliation. Oh, but I'm the offended party. So was God. And he went straight away and sought reconciliation. Oh, but I have been insulted. Just so, so was God. All the wrong was towards him. Yet he sent, oh, but the party is so unworthy, so are you. But God loved you and sent his son. Verse 12 says, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed in the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. If we do not love one another, how can we say that we've received the love of God? 
and have been born of him. Love is the proof that we are taught to look for. God pours his love into our lives that it might pour out. Elizabeth Elliot said this, love means self-giving, self-giving means sacrifice, and sacrifice means death. I'm gonna read you a quick story. This is um, Elizabeth Elliot, and she's, um, this was her, she was married uh, three times, I think, and let's see, the first one, you know, died in, as a missionary, the second one died of sickness, and this is her third husband, who is a hospital chaplain, and they're at um, a geriatric board, and let me just read you this story of love. <clears throat> we eat breakfast with Mr. Smith, a very handsome man with white hair, ruddy skin, and bright blue eyes. He's wearing a blue shirt and a blue sweater, and he tells us a story which brings into sharp focus the words of the wedding vows in sickness and in health, for better, for worse. His wife has been a patient at at the hospital for three years. When she first got sick, I carried her everywhere. I did. The doctors said she'll get worse every week and every month, so if you want to go on trips or anywhere, go now. We had some good times, me and her, but the doctor said, you can't stand it. You won't be able to stand it. Well, I said, I'm going to hang on as long as I can. I took care of her for five years, but I lost 52 pounds from just worry. I was so tense, they broke three needles trying to put a shot in my arm. Well, I carried her to 25 doctors, but they couldn't do anything. It's brain deterioration, they told me. I did everything for her. I dressed her and fed her and everything. But it liked to whoop me, and if it hadn't have been for the good Lord, I'd never made it. The doctor said I'd sworn you would have never lasted six months. But a lot of people were praying for me. Oh yes, but finally I had to give, it up, give up and put her here. She can't do anything, can't move or speak or hear. She's in the pre-birth position, legs and arms locked, heels locked up tight. You can't straighten her out, but I come every other day. I go in and I kiss her. I kiss her about a dozen times. I just love her to death. I talk to her. She doesn't hear me, but she knows my touch. Well, Mr. Smith finished his story. I work for the florist here. I volunteer, you know. I go around the wards carrying flowers. We went later to see Mrs. Smith. If ever there was a sight to confound a man's love for a woman, to strain to the, to the breaking point the most potent human passion, we saw it in that stark white crib, a crumpled scrap of inert humanity. But there is a love that is as strong as death, a love many waters cannot quench, Floods cannot drown. That's the kind of love that we are called to have for one another. I want to close with one more thing to read you. It's a prayer by Amy Carmichael. She says, <clears throat> Love through me, love of God. There is no love in me. O oh, fire of love, light thou the love that burns perpetually. O oh, blessed love of God, that all may taste and see how good thou art. Once more I pray, love through me, even me. Let's pray. Father, my prayer is 
that we would be known by the love that we have one for another. God, we know that this love comes from you. We know that we can't love without you. God, work in us individually. God, I pray that that would be our individual desire. That we would love that we would love others around us, that we would see needs that need to be met, that we would see the people that need to be prayed for. God, that we would see those who are hurting. God, that we would see those who just need a touch. God, use us to bring love to this lost and hurting and dying world. God, focus our eyes on the cross. We thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.